Section 38 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 1. China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Edited by Ava March Tappan. Section 38. How Kublai Khan Went A-Hunting by Marco Polo. The great Khan starts off the first day of March and travels southward towards the ocean sea, a journey of two days. He takes with him full ten thousand falconers and some five hundred gerfalcons, besides peregrines, sakers, and other hawks in great numbers, and goshawks also to fly at the waterfowl. But do not suppose that he keeps all these together by him. They are distributed about, hither and thither, one hundred together, or two hundred at the utmost, as he thinks proper. But they are always fouling as they advance, and the most part of the quarry taken is carried to the emperor. And let me tell you, when he goes thus a fouling with his ger falcons and other hawks, he is attended by full ten thousand men who are disposed in couples. These are called toshio, which is as much as to say watchers, and the name describes their business. They are posted from spot to spot, always in couples, and thus they cover a great deal of ground. Every man of them is provided with a whistle and hood, so as to be able to call in a hawk and hold it in his hand and when the emperor makes a cast there is no need that he follow it up for those men i speak of keep so good a lookout that they never lose sight of the birds and if these have need of help they are ready to render it all the emperor's hawks and those of the barons as well have a little label attached to the leg to mark them on which is written the names of the owner and the keeper of the bird and in this way the hawk when caught is at once identified and handed over to its owner but if not the bird is carried to a certain baron who is styled the bowler gucci which is as much to say the keeper of lost property and i tell you that whatever may be found without a known owner whether it be a horse or a sword or a hawk or what not it is carried to that baron straightway, and he takes charge of it. And if the finder neglects to carry his trover to the baron, the latter punishes him. Likewise, the loser of any article goes to the baron, and if the thing be in his hands, it is immediately given up to the owner. Moreover, the said baron always pitches on the highest spot of the camp, with his banner displayed, in order that those who have lost or found anything may have no difficulty in finding their way to him. Thus nothing can be lost, but it shall be incontinently found and restored. And so the emperor follows this road that I have mentioned, leading along in the vicinity of the ocean sea, which is within two days' journey of his capital city, Kambaluk, and as he goes there, is many a fine sight to be seen, and plenty of the very best entertainment in hawking. In fact, there is no sport in the world to equal it. The emperor himself is carried upon four elephants in a fine chamber made of timber, lined inside with plates of beaten gold, and outside with Hans' skins, for he always travels in this way, on his fowling expeditions, because he is troubled with gout. He always keeps beside him a dozen of his choicest gerfalcons, and is attended by several of his barons who ride on horseback alongside. And sometimes, as they may be going along, and the emperor from his chamber is holding discourse with the barons, one of the latter shall exclaim, Sire, look out for cranes! Then the emperor instantly has the top of his chamber thrown open, and having marked the cranes, he casts one of his gerfalcons 
whichever he pleases and often the quarry is struck within his view so that he has the more exquisite sport and diversion there as he sits in his chamber or he's on his bed and all the barons with him get the enjoyment of it likewise so it is not without reason i tell you that i do not believe there ever existed in the world or ever will exist a man with such sport and enjoyment as he has or with such rare opportunities and when he has travelled till he reaches a place called keshar modan there he finds his tents pitched with the tents of his sons and his barons and those of his ladies and theirs so that there shall be full ten thousand tents in all and all fine and rich ones and i will tell you how his own quarters are disposed the tent in which he holds his courts is large enough to give cover easily to a thousand souls it is pitched with its door to the south and the barons and knights remain in waiting in it whilst the lord abides in another close to it on the west side when he wishes to speak with any one he causes the person to be summoned to that other tent immediately behind the great tent there is a fine large chamber where the lord sleeps and there are also many other tents and chambers but they are not in contact with the great tent as these are the two audience tents and the sleeping chamber are constructed in this way each of the audience tents has three poles which are of spice wood and are most artfully covered with lion skins striped with black and white and red so that they do not suffer from any weather all three apartments are also covered outside with similar skins of striped lions a substance that lasts for ever and inside they are all lined with ermine and sable these two being the finest and most costly furs in existence for a robe of sable large enough to line a mantle is worth two thousand bezants of gold or one thousand at least and this kind of skin is called by the totters the king of furs the beast itself is about the size of a marten these two furs of which i speak are applied and inlaid so exquisitely that it is really worth seeing all the tent ropes are of silk and in short i may say that those tents to wit the two audience halls and the sleeping chamber are so costly that it is not every king could pay for them round about these tents are others also fine ones and beautifully pitched in which are the emperor's ladies and the ladies of the other princes and officers and then there are the tents for the hawks and their keepers so that altogether the number of tents there on the plain is something wonderful to see the many people that are thronging to and fro on every side and every day there you would take the camp for a good big city for you must reckon the leeches and the astrologers and the falconers and all of the other attendants on so great a company and add that everybody there has his whole family with him for such is their custom the lord remains encamped there until the spring and all that time he does nothing but go hawking round about among the canebrakes along the lakes and rivers that abound in that region and across fine plains on which are plenty of cranes and swans and all sorts of other fowl the other gentry of the camp also are never done with hunting and hawking and every day they bring home great store of venison and feathered game of all sorts indeed without having witnessed it you would never believe what quantities of game are taken and what marvellous sport and diversion they all have whilst they are in camp there end of section thirty eight this recording is in the public domain Section 39 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 1, China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific, edited by Ava March Tappan. Section 39. How the Khan Sent His Messages, by Marco Polo. Now you must know, that from this city of Cambaluc proceeded many roads and highways, leading to a variety of provinces, one to one province, another to another, and each road receives the name of the province to which it leads, and it is a very sensible plan. And the messengers of the emperor, in travelling from Cambaluc, be the road whichsoever they will, find it every twenty-five miles of a journey a station which they call yam or as we should say the horse post-house and at each of these stations used by the messengers there is a large and handsome building for them to put up at in which they find all the rooms furnished with fine beds and all other necessary articles in rich silk and where they are provided with everything they can want. If even a king were to arrive at one of these, he would find himself well lodged. At some of these stations, moreover, there shall be posted some four hundred horses, standing ready for the use of the messengers. At others, there shall be two hundred, according to the requirements, and to what the emperor has established in each case at every twenty-five miles, as I said, or anyhow at every thirty miles, you find one of these stations, on all the principal highways leading to the different provincial governments. And the same is the case throughout all the chief provinces subject to the Great Khan. Even when the messengers have to pass through a roadless tract, where neither house nor hostel exists, Still there, the station houses have been established just the same, excepting that the intervals are somewhat greater, and the day's journey is fixed at thirty-five to forty miles, instead of twenty-five to thirty. But they are provided with horses and all the other necessaries, just like those we have described, so that the emperor's messengers, come they from what region they may, find everything ready for them. And in sooth, this is a thing done on the greatest scale of magnificence that ever was seen. Never had emperor, king, or lord such wealth as this manifests. For it is a fact that on all these posts taken together there are more than three hundred thousand horses kept up specially for the use of the messengers. And the great buildings that I have mentioned are more than ten thousand in number, all richly furnished, as I told you. The thing is on a scale so wonderful and costly that it is hard to bring one's self to describe it. But now I will tell you another thing that I had forgotten, but which ought to be told whilst I am on the subject. You must know that by the great Khan's orders there has been established between these post-houses, at every interval of three miles, a little fort with some forty houses round about it, in which dwell the people who act as the emperor's foot-runners. Every one of those runners wears a great wide belt set all over with bells, so that as they run the three miles from post to post their bells are heard jingling a long way off and thus on reaching the post the runner finds another man similarly equipped and all ready to take his place who instantly takes over whatsoever he has in charge and with it receives a slip of paper from the clerk who is always at hand for the purpose and so the new man sets off and runs his three miles at the next station he finds his relief ready in like manner and so the post proceeds with a change every three miles and in this way the emperor who has an immense number of these runners receives dispatches with news from places ten days journey off in one day and a night or if need be news from a hundred days off in ten days and nights and that is no small matter in fact in the fruit season 
many a time fruit shall be gathered one morning in Kambaluk, and the evening of the next day it shall reach the great Khan at Shandu, a distance of ten days' journey. The clerk at each of the posts notes the time of each courier's arrival and departure, and there are often other officers whose business it is to make monthly visitation of all the posts, and to punish those runners who have been slack in their work. The emperor exempts these men from all tribute, and pays them besides. Moreover, there are also at those stations other men equipped similarly with girdles hung with bells, who are employed for expresses, when there is a call for great haste in sending dispatches to any governor of a province, or to give news when any baron has revolted, or in any other such emergencies and these men travel a good two hundred or two hundred and fifty miles in the day, and as much more in the night. I'll tell you how it stands. They take a horse from those at the station, which are standing ready saddled, all fresh and in wind, and mount and go at full speed as hard as they can ride, in fact. And when those at the next post hear the bells, they get ready another horse, and a man equipped in the same way, and he takes over the letter, or whatever it may be, and is off full speed to the third station, where again a fresh horse is found already. And so the dispatch speeds along from post to post, always at full gallop with regular change of horses. And the speed at which they go is marvelous. By night, however, they cannot go so fast as by day, because they have to be accompanied by footmen with torches who could not keep up with them at full speed. Those men are highly prized, and they could never do it, did they not bind hard the stomach, chest, and head with strong bands. And each of them carries with him a gerfalcon tablet, in sign that he is bound on an urgent express, so that if perchance his horse break down, or he meet with other mishap, whomsoever he may fall in with on that road, he is empowered to make dismount and give up his horse. Nobody dares refuse in such a case, so that the courier hath always a good fresh nag to carry him. Now all these numbers of post-horses cost the emperor nothing at all, and I will tell you the how and the why. Every city or village or hamlet that stands near one of those post-stations has a fixed demand made on it for as many horses as it can supply, and these it must furnish to the post, and in this way are provided all the posts of the cities, as well as the towns and villages round about them. Only in uninhabited tracts the horses are furnished at the expense of the emperor himself. Nor do the cities maintain the full number, say, of four hundred horses always at their station, but month by month two hundred shall be kept at the station, and the other two hundred at grass, coming in their turn to relieve the first two hundred. And if there chance to be some river or lake to be passed by the runners and horse posts, the neighboring cities are bound to keep three or four boats in constant readiness for that purpose. End of section 39 this recording is in the public domain. Section 40 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter The King's Messenger by Chuang Tzu 4th Century B.C. Brilliant, bright, the blossoms glow On the level heights and the marshlands low. The royal messenger am I, at the king's command I can swiftly fly. Equipped with all that man may need, Alert, determined to succeed. Three teams of horses, young and strong, I have to whirl my car along. My steeds are white, or grey, or pied, Well skilled am I each team to guide. We gallop till the sweat flakes stain With large wet spots each glossy rain. Each man I meet without delay Must tell me all he has to say. The realm I traverse till I bring 
the counsel sought for by the king. End of section 40. This recording is in the public domain. Section 41 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Peter. The World Story, Volume 1. China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Edited by Ava March Tappan. Section 41. The Polos Teach the Khan How to Capture a City. By Marco Polo. Now you must know that the city, Sayanfu, held out against the great Khan for three years after the rest of Manzi, southern China, had surrendered. The great Khan's troops made incessant attempts to take it, but they could not succeed because of the great and deep waters that were round about it, so that they could approach from one side only, which was the north. And I tell you they never would have taken it, but for a circumstance that I am going to relate. You must know that when the great Khan's host had lain three years before the city without being able to take it, they were greatly chafed thereat. Then Mr. Niccolo Polo and Mr. Maffio and Mr. Marco said, We could find you a way of forcing the city to surrender speedily. Whereupon those of the army replied that they would be right glad to know how that should be. All this talk took place in the presence of the great Khan, for messengers had been dispatched from the camp to tell him that there was no taking the city by blockade, for it continually received supplies of victuals from those sides which they were unable to invest, and the great Khan had sent back word that take it they must, and find a way how. Then spoke up the two brothers, and Mr. Marco the son, and said, Great Prince, we have with us among our followers men who are able to construct mangonels which shall cast such great stones that the garrison will never be able to stand them but will surrender incontinently as soon as the mangonels or trebuchets shall have shot into the town the khan bade them with all his heart have such mangonels made as speedily as possible now mr niccolo and his brother and his son immediately caused timber to be brought as much as they desired and fit for the work in hand and they had two men among their followers, a German and an Astorian Christian, who were masters of that business, and these they directed to construct two or three mangonels capable of casting stones of three hundred pounds weight. Accordingly they made three fine mangonels, each of which cast stones of three hundred pounds weight and more, and when they were complete and ready for use, the emperor and the others were greatly pleased to see them, and caused several stones to be shot in their presence, whereat they marvelled greatly, and greatly praised the work. And the Khan ordered that the engine should be carried to his army, which was at the leaguer of Sanfu. And when the engines were got into the camp, they were forthwith set up, to the great admiration of the Tartars. And what shall I tell you? When the engines were set up and put in gear, a stone was shot from each of them into the town. These took effect among the buildings, crashing and smashing through everything with huge din and commotion. And when the townspeople witnessed this new and strange visitation, they were so astonished and dismayed that they knew not what to do or say. They took counsel together, but no counsel could be suggested how to escape from these engines, for the things seemed to them to be done by sorcery. They declared that they were all dead men if they yielded not so they determined to surrender on such conditions as they could get. Wherefore they straightway sent word to the commander of the army that they were ready to surrender on the same terms as the other cities of the province had done, and to become the subjects of the great Khan, and to this the captain of the host consented. So the men of the city surrendered, and were received to terms, and this all came about through the exertions of Mr. Niccolo and Mr. Maffio and Mr. Marco, and it was no small matter, for this city and province is one of the best that the great Khan possesses, and brings him in great revenues. End of section 41. This recording is in the public domain.
Section 42 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra Schmidt. The World Story, Volume 1. China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 42. A Chinese City at the End of the Thirteenth Century by Marco Polo When you have left the city of Chang'an and have travelled for three days through a splendid country, passing a number of towns and villages, you arrive at the most noble city of Kinsai, Hangchao, a name which is as much as to say in our tongue, the City of Heaven. And since we have got thither, I will enter into particulars about its magnificence and these are well worth the telling for the city is beyond dispute the finest and the noblest in the world in this we shall speak according to the written statement which the queen of this realm sent to bayan the conqueror of the country for transmission to the great khan in order that he might be aware of the surpassing grandeur of the city and might be moved to save it from destruction or injury i will tell you all the truth as it was set down in that document for truth it was as the said messer marco polo at a later date was able to witness with his own eyes and now we shall rehearse these particulars first and foremost then the document stated the city of kinsai to be so great that it has a hundred miles of compass and there are in it twelve thousand bridges of stone for the most part so lofty that a great fleet could pass beneath them and let no man marvel that there are so many bridges for you see the whole city stands as it were in the water and surrounded by water so that a great many bridges are required to give free passage about it and though the bridges be so high the approaches are so well contrived that carts and horses do cross them the document aforesaid also went on to state that there were in this city twelve guilds of the different crafts and that each guild had twelve thousand houses in the occupation of its workmen each of these houses contains at least twelve men whilst some contain twenty and some forty not that these are all masters but inclusive of the journeymen who work under the masters and yet all these craftsmen had full occupation for many other cities of the kingdom are supplied from this city with what they require the document aforesaid also stated that the number and wealth of the merchants and the amount of goods that passed through their hands was so enormous that no man could form a just estimate thereof and i should have told you with regard to those masters of the different crafts who are at the head of such houses as i have mentioned that neither they nor their wives ever touch a piece of work with their own hands but live as nicely and delicately as if they were kings and queens the wives indeed are most dainty and angelic creatures moreover it was an ordinance laid down by the king that every man should follow his father's business and no other no matter if he possessed one hundred thousand peasants inside of the city there is a lake which has a compass of some thirty miles and all around it are erected beautiful palaces and mansions of the richest and most exquisite structure that you can imagine belonging to the nobles of the city there are also on its shores many abbeys and churches of the idolaters in the middle of the lake are two islands on each of which stands a rich beautiful and spacious edifice furnished in such style as to seem fit for the palace of an emperor and when any one of the citizens desired to hold a marriage feast or to give any other entertainment it used to be done at one of these palaces and everything would be found there ready to order such as silver plate trenchers and dishes napkins and tablecloths and whatever else was needful the king made this provision for the gratification of his people and the place was open to every one who desired to give an entertainment sometimes there would be at these palaces a hundred different parties some holding a banquet others celebrating a wedding and yet all would find good accommodation in the different apartments and pavilions and that in so well ordered a manner that one party was never in the way of another the houses of the city are provided with lofty towers of stone in which articles of value are stored for fear of fire 
for most of the houses themselves are of timber and fires are very frequent in the city the people are idolaters and since they were conquered by the great khan they use paper money both men and women are fair and comely and for the most part clothe themselves in silk so vast is the supply of that material both from the whole district of kinsai and from the imports by traders from other provinces and you must know they eat every kind of flesh even that of dogs and other unclean beasts which nothing would induce a christian to eat since the great khan occupied the city he has ordained that each of the twelve thousand bridges should be provided with a guard of ten men in case of any disturbance or of any being so rash as to plot treason or insurrection against him each guard is provided with a hollow instrument of wood and with a metal basin and with a timekeeper to enable them to know the hour of the day or night and so when one hour of the night is past the sentry strikes one on the wooden instrument and on the basin so that the whole quarter of the city is made aware that one hour of the night is gone at the second hour he gives two strokes and so on keeping always wide awake and on the lookout in the morning again from the sunrise they begin to count anew and strike one hour as they did in the night and so on hour after hour part of the watch patrols the quarter to see if any light or fire is burning after the lawful hours if they find any they mark the door and in the morning the owner is summoned before the magistrates and unless he can plead a good excuse he is punished also if they find any one going about the streets at unlawful hours they arrest him and in the morning they bring him before the magistrates likewise if in the daytime they find any poor cripple unable to work for his livelihood they take him to one of the hospitals of which there are many founded by the ancient kings and endowed with great revenues or if he be capable of work they oblige him to take up some trade if they see that any house has caught fire they immediately beat upon that wooden instrument to give the alarm and this brings together the watchmen from the other bridges to help to extinguish it and to save the goods of the merchants or others either by removing them to the towers above mentioned or by putting them in boats and transporting them to the islands in the lake for no citizen dares leave his house at night or to come near the fire only those who own the property and those watchmen who flock to help of whom there shall come one or two thousand at the least moreover within the city there is an eminence on which stands a tower and at the top of the tower is hung a slab of wood whenever fire or any other alarm breaks out in the city a man who stands there with a mallet in his hand beats upon the slab making a noise that is heard to a great distance so when the blows upon this slab are heard everybody is aware that fire has broken out or that there is some cause of alarm all the streets of the city are paved with stone or brick as indeed are all the highways throughout manzi so that you ride and travel in every direction without inconvenience were it not for this pavement you could not do so for the country is very low and flat and after rain it is deep in mire and water but as the great khan's couriers could not gallop their horses over the pavement the side of the road is left unpaved for their convenience the pavement of the main street of the city also is laid out in two parallel ways of ten paces in width on either side leaving a space in the middle laid with fine gravel under which are vaulted drains which convey the rain-water into the canals and thus the road is kept ever dry you must know also that the city of kinsai has some three thousand baths the water of which is supplied by springs they are hot baths and the people take great delight in them frequenting them several times a month for they are very cleanly in their persons they are the finest and largest baths in the world large enough for one hundred persons to bathe together when any one dies the friends and relations make a great mourning for the deceased and clothe themselves in hempen garments and follow the corpse playing on a variety of instruments and singing hymns to their idols and when they come to the burning place they take representations of things cut out of parchment such as caparisoned horses male and female slaves camels armor suits of cloth of gold and money in great quantities and these things 
they put on the fire along with the corpse so that they are all burned with it and they tell you that the dead men shall have all these slaves and animals of which the effigies are burned alive in flesh and blood and the money in gold at his disposal in the next world and that the instruments which they have caused to be played at his funeral and the idle hymns that have been chanted shall also be produced again to welcome him in the next world and that the idols themselves will come to do him honour furthermore there exists in this city a palace of the king who fled him who was emperor of manzi and that is the greatest palace in the world as i shall tell you more particularly for you must know its domain has a compass of ten miles all enclosed with lofty battlemented walls and inside the walls are the finest and most delectable gardens upon earth and filled with the finest fruits there are numerous fountains in it also and lakes full of fish in the middle is the palace itself a great and splendid building it contains twenty great and handsome halls one of which is more spacious than the rest and affords room for a vast multitude to dine it is all painted in gold with many histories and representations of beasts and birds of knights and dames and many marvellous things it forms a really magnificent spectacle for over all the walls and all the ceiling you see nothing but paintings in gold and besides these halls the palace contains one thousand large and handsome chambers all painted in gold and diverse colours there is one church only belonging to the nestorian christians there is another thing i must tell you it is the custom for every burgess of this city and in fact for every description of person in it to write over his door his own name the name of his wife and those of his children his slaves and all the inmates of his house and also the number of animals that he keeps and if any one dies in the house then the name of that person is erased and if any child is born its name is added so in this way the sovereign is able to know exactly the population of the city and this is the practice also throughout all manzi and cathay and i must tell you that every hosteler who keeps a hostel for travellers is bound to register their names and surnames as well as the day and month of their arrival and departure and thus the sovereign has the means of knowing whenever it pleases him who come and go throughout his dominions and certes this is a wise order and a provident end of section forty two this recording is in the public domain section forty three of china japan and the islands of the pacific ready for librivox dot org by brianna the peking observatory photograph page a hundred and twenty eight in the thirteenth century three hundred years before the birth of galileo and at a time when europe was just emerging from the dark ages this astronomical observatory was erected by the mongol emperors the instrument shown in this picture is made of solid bronze it is of huge dimensions and the beautiful workmanship shows that even in that early age the art of casting had been carried to perfection by the chinese the outer framework is a heavy metal horizon divided into twelve equal parts for the twelve hours into which the chinese divide their day and night and also marked to designate the points of the compass the inside of the ring bears the names of the twelve states into which china was anciently divided every part of the empire being supposed to be under the influence of a particular quarter of the heavens within this is a complicated arrangement of circles and elliptics illustrating the various movements of the earth and planets and divided into portions representing the constellations and the months and days of the year in the center is a revolving tube for taking sights and at the four corners are miniature rocks of bronze marked northwest mountain southwest mountain 
southeast mountain and northeast mountain an interesting touch of superstition is given by the four dragons which uphold the instrument and are chained to the earth to prevent their flying away end of section forty three this recording is in the public domain section forty four of china japan and the islands of the pacific read for librivox dot org by thomas peter china part seven chinese fables and tales historical note chinese literature is richest in histories commentaries on the classics and poetry one of its most striking features is the colossal scale on which works have been compiled an official history, completed in 1633, comprised 3,706 books, a collection of the Chinese classics, with their commentaries begun by the Emperor Qin Long, is said to have numbered 180,000 volumes, and an anthology published in 1707 contained nearly 50,000 poems arranged in 900 volumes. Most remarkable of all is an encyclopedia of history, philosophy, and literature, ordered by the third emperor of the ming dynasty more than two thousand writers labored on this for five years and the result was a work of nine hundred and seventeen thousand four hundred and eighty pages the equivalent of about four hundred and eighty nine million two hundred and twenty six thousand english words this extraordinary work was never published owing to lack of money but three copies were made by hand all of which have since perished. However, as with us, while the classics are respected and studied in school, the great mass of people depend on stories for their reading. End of section 44. This recording is in the public domain. Section 45 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific read for LibriVox.org by Andrea The Boy Philosopher by Unknown There was a wealthy man of Qi named Tian Tzu who daily fed a thousand people in his own mansion. Among them was one who reverently presented his host with a fish and a goose. Tian Tzu looked at the offering and sighed. How bountiful, he exclaimed, is heaven to men! It gives us the nutritious grain for food and produces birds and fishes for our use. All the guests applauded this pious sentiment to the echo, except the young son of a certain Mr. Pao, a lad of twelve years old who, leaving his back seat and running forward, said, You would be nearer the truth, sir, if you said that heaven, earth, and everything else belong to the same category and that therefore nothing in that category is superior to the rest. The only difference which exists is a matter of size, intelligence, and strength, by virtue of which all these things act and prey upon each other. So it is quite a mistake to say that one is created for the sake of others. Whatever a man can get to eat, he eats. How can it be that heaven originally intended it, for the use of men, and therefore created it. Besides, we all know that gnats and mosquitoes suck our skins, and tigers and wolves devour our flesh, so that, according to your theory, we were ourselves created by heaven for the special benefit of gnats and mosquitoes, tigers and wolves. Do you believe that, pray? End of section 45 this recording is in the public domain. Section 46 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific Ready for LibriVox.org by Brianna The Elixir of Life Once upon a time it was reported that there was a person who professed to have the secret of immortality. The king of Yen, therefore, sent messengers to inquire about it. But they dawdled on the road, and before they had arrived, 
at their destination, the man was already dead. Then the king was very angry and sought to slay the messengers, but his favorite minister expostulated with him, saying, There is nothing which causes greater sorrow to men than death. There is nothing they value more highly than life. Now, the very man who said he possessed the secret of immortality is dead himself. How then could he have prevented your majesty from dying? So the man's lives were spared. End of section 46. This recording is in the public domain. Section 47 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Read for LibriVox.org by Sarah Hale. The Tiger and the Monkey by Unknown. A tiger having clapped his paw on an unlucky monkey, the latter begged to be released on the score of his insignificance and promised to show the tiger where he might find more valuable prey. The tiger complied, and the monkey conducted him to a hillside where an ass was feeding, an animal which the tiger till then had never seen. My good brother, said the ass to the monkey, hitherto you have always brought me two tigers. How is it that you have only brought me one today? Hearing these words, the tiger fled for his life. Thus ready wit may often ward off great dangers. End of section 47. This recording is in the public domain. Section 48 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter Was he the only cheat? By Unknown At Hangchow there lived a costermonger who understood how to keep oranges a whole year without letting them spoil. His fruit was always fresh-looking, firm as jade, and of a beautiful golden hue, but inside dry as an old cocoon. One day I asked him, saying, Are your oranges for altar or sacrificial purposes, or for show at banquets, or do you make this outside display merely to cheat the foolish, as cheat them you most outrageously do? Sir, replied the orangeman, I have carried on this trade now for many years. It is my source of livelihood. I sell, the world buys, and I have yet to learn that you are the only honest man about, and that I am the only cheat. Perhaps it never struck you in this light. The baton-bearers of to-day, seated on their tiger-skins, pose as the martial guardians of the state. But what are they compared with the captains of old? The broad-brimmed, long-robed ministers of to-day pose as pillars of the Constitution. But have they the wisdom of our ancient counsellors? Evil doers arise, and none can subdue them. The people are in misery, and none can relieve them. Clerks are corrupt, and none can restrain them. Laws decay, and none can renew them. Our officials eat the bread of the state, and know no shame. They sit in lofty halls, ride fine steeds, drink themselves drunk with wine, and batten on the richest fare. Which of them but puts on an awe-inspiring look? A dignified mien, all gold and gems without, but dry cocoons within. You pay, sir, no heed to these things, while you are very particular about my oranges. I had no answer to make. I retired to ponder over this costermonger's wit. Was he really out of conceit with the age, or only quizzing me in defense of his fruit? End of section 48. This recording is in the public domain. Section 49 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Read for LibriVox.org by Eva Davis. 
the appeal of lady chang may it please your majesty my husband was a censor attached to the board of rights for his folly in recklessly advising your majesty he deserved indeed a thousand deaths yet under the imperial clemency he was doomed only to await his sentence in prison since then fourteen years have passed away his aged parents are still alive but there are no children in his hall and the wretched man has none on whom he can rely i alone remain a lodger at an inn working day and night at my needle to provide the necessaries of life encompassed on all sides by difficulties to whom every day seems a year my father-in-law is eighty-seven years of age he trembles on the brink of the grave he is like a candle in the wind i have not wherewith to nourish him alive or to honour him when dead i am a lone woman if i tend the one i lose the other if i return to my father-in-law my husband will die of starvation if i remain to feed him my father-in-law may die at any hour my husband is a criminal bound in jail he dares give no thought to his home yet can it be when all living things are rejoicing in life under the wise and generous rule of to-day we alone should taste the cup of poverty and distress and find ourselves beyond the pale of universal peace oft as i think of these things the desire to die comes upon me but i swallow my grief and live on trusting in providence for some happy termination some moistening with the dew of imperial grace and now that my father-in-law is face to face with death now that my husband can hardly expect to live i venture to offer this body as a hostage to be bound in prison while my husband returns to watch over the last hours of his father then when all is over he will resume his place and await your majesty's pleasure thus my husband will greet his father once again and the feelings of father and child will be in some measure relieved thus i shall give to my father-in-law the comfort of his son and the duty of a wife towards her husband will be fulfilled lady chang won her petition and her husband was released end of section forty nine this recording is in the public domain section fifty of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tony Addison The World's Story, Volume 1 China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific Edited by Ava March Tapan Section 50 The Soul of the Great Bell By Lafcadio Hearn the water clock marks the hour in the Tachungse, in the tower of the great bell. Now the mallet is lifted to smite the lips of the metal monster, the vast lips inscribed with Buddhist texts from the sacred Tahua King, from the chapters of the holy Ling Yen King. Here, the great bell responding, how mighty her voice, though tongueless! Nagai. all the little dragons on the high tilted eaves of the green roofs shiver to the tips of their gilded tails under that deep wave of sound all the porcelain gargoyles tremble on their carven perches all the hundred little bells of the pagodas quiver with desire to speak Ko Nagai all the green and gold tiles of the temple are vibrating the wooden goldfish above them are writhing against the sky the uplifted finger of foe 
shakes high over the heads of the worshippers through the blue fog of incense ko nagai what a thunder tone was that all the lacquered goblins on the palace cornices wriggle their fire-coloured tongues and after each huge shock how wondrous the multiple echo and the great golden moan and at last the sudden sibilant sobbing in the ears when the immense tone faints away in broken whispers of silver as though a woman should whisper yai even so the great bell hath sounded every day for well nigh five hundred years ko nagai first with stupendous clang then with immeasurable moan of gold then with silver murmuring of hai and there is not a child in all the many-coloured ways of the old chinese city who does not know the story of the great bell who cannot tell you why the great bell says ko nagai and hai now this is the story of the great bell in the tachungse as the same is related in the pe hiao to choi written by the learned yu pao chen of the city of quang chao fu nearly five hundred years ago the celestially august the son of heaven yong lo of the illustrious or ming dynasty commanded the worthy official kuan yu that he should have a bell made of such size that the sound thereof might be heard for one hundred li and he further ordained that the voice of the bell should be strengthened with brass and deepened with gold and sweetened with silver and that the face and the great lips of it should be graven with blessed sayings from the sacred books and that it should be suspended in the centre of the imperial capital to sound through all the many-coloured ways of the city of peking therefore the worthy mandarin kuan yu assembled the master moulders and the renowned bellsmiths of the empire and all men of great repute and cunning in foundry work and they measured the materials for the alloy and treated them skilfully and prepared the moulds the fires the instruments and the monstrous melting pot for fusing the metal and they laboured exceedingly like giants neglecting only rest and sleep and the comforts of life toiling both night and day in obedience to kuan yu and striving in all things to do the behest of the son of heaven but when the metal had been cast and the earthen mould separated from the glowing casting it was discovered that despite their great labour and ceaseless care the result was void of work for the metals had rebelled one against the other the gold had scorned alliance with the brass the silver would not mingle with the molten iron therefore the moulds had to be once more prepared and the fires rekindled and the metal remelted and all the work tediously and toilsomely repeated the son of heaven heard and was angry but spake nothing a second time the bell was cast and the result was even worse still the metals obstinately refused to blend one with the other and there was no uniformity in the bell and the sides of it were cracked and fissured and the lips of it were slagged and split asunder so that all the labour had to be repeated even a third time to the great dismay of kuan yu and when the son of heaven heard these things he was angrier than before and sent his messenger to kuan yu with a letter written upon lemon-coloured silk and sealed with the seal of the dragon containing these words 
from the mighty young lo the sublime tight song the celestial and august whose reign is called ming to kuan yu the full yin twice thou hast betrayed the trust we have deigned graciously to place in thee if thou fail a third time in fulfilling our command thy head shall be severed from thy neck tremble and obey now kuan yu had a daughter of dazzling loveliness whose name ko nagai was ever in the mouths of poets and whose heart was even more beautiful than her face ko nagai loved her father with such love that she had refused a hundred worthy suitors rather than make his home desolate by her absence and when she had seen the awful yellow missive sealed with the dragon seal she fainted away with fear for her father's sake and when her senses and her strength returned to her she could not rest or sleep for thinking of her parents danger until she had secretly sold some of her jewels and with the money so obtained had hastened to an astrologer and paid him a great price to advise her by what means her father might be saved from the peril impending over him so the astrologer made observations of the heavens and marked the aspect of the silver stream which we call the milky way and examined the signs of the zodiac the huang tao or yellow road and consulted the table of the five hin or principles of the universe and the mystical books of the alchemists and after a long silence he made answer to her saying gold and brass will never meet in wedlock silver and iron never will embrace until the flesh of a maiden be melted in the crucible until the blood of a virgin be mixed with the metals in their fusion so Kornagai returned home sorrowful at heart but she kept secret all that she had heard and told no one what she had done at last came the awful day when the third and last effort to cast the great bell was to be made and called nagai together with her waiting woman accompanied her father to the foundry and they took their places upon a platform overlooking the toiling of the moulders and the lava of liquefied metal all the workmen wrought their tasks in silence there was no sound heard but the muttering of the fires and the muttering deepened into a roar like the roar of typhoons approaching and the blood-red lake of metal slowly brightened like the vermilion of a sunrise and the vermilion was transmuted into a radiant glow of gold and the gold whitened blindingly like the silver face of a full moon then the workers ceased to feed the raving flame and all fixed their eyes upon the eyes of kuan yu and kuan yu prepared to give the signal to cast but ere ever he lifted his finger a cry caused him to turn his head and all heard the voice of ko nagai sounding sharply sweet as a bird song above the great thunder of the fires for thy sake o my father and even as she cried she leaped into the white blood of metal and the lava of the furnace roared to receive her and spattered monstrous flakes of flame to the roof and burst over the verge of the earthen crater and cast up a whirling fountain of many-coloured fires and subsided quakingly with lightnings and with thunders and with mutterings then the father of konagai wild with his grief would have leaped after her but that strong men held him back and kept firm grasp upon him until he had fainted dead away and they could bear him like one dead to his home and the serving woman of konagai dizzy and speechless for pain stood before the furnace still holding in her hands a shoe a tiny 
dainty shoe with embroidery of pearls and flowers the shoe of her beautiful mistress that was for she had sought to grasp konagai by the foot as she leaped but had only been able to clutch the shoe and the pretty shoe came off in her hand and she continued to stare at it like one gone mad but in spite of all these things the command of the celestial and august had to be obeyed and the work of the moulders to be finished hopeless as the result might be yet the glow of the metal seemed purer and whiter than before and there was no sign of the beautiful body that had been entombed therein so the ponderous casting was made and lo when the metal had become cool it was found that the bell was beautiful to look upon and perfect in form and wonderful in colour above all other bells nor was there any trace found of the body of konagai for it had been totally absorbed by the precious alloy and blended with the well-blended brass and gold with the intermingling of the silver and the iron and when they sounded the bell its tones were found to be deeper and mellower and mightier than the tones of any other bell reaching even beyond the distance of one hundred li like a pealing of summer thunder and yet also like some vast voice uttering a name a woman's name the name of konagai and still between each mighty stroke there is a long low moaning heard and ever the moaning ends with a sound of sobbing and of complaining as though a weeping woman should murmur hi and still when the people hear that great golden moan they keep silence but when the sharp sweet shuddering comes in the air and the sobbing of Ey! then indeed do all the Chinese mothers, in all the many-coloured ways of peeking, whisper to the little ones, Listen, that is Konagai crying for her shoe. That is Konagai calling for her shoe. End of section 50 This recording is in the public domain. Section 51 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific Read for LibriVox.org by Engineer STL China, Part 8, The Coming of the Missionaries Historical Note Just when Christianity first made its way to China is not known. There is a tradition that St. Thomas traveled far to the east, but the first Christian preaching that is recorded took place in the 7th century. The missionaries were of the sect known as Nestorians. No one has ever found any of their books or writings in China, but a thousand years after they are said to have come to the country, some workmen in northwestern China who were digging a trench came upon a slab of stone on which was writing, partly in Chinese and partly in Syriac letters used by Nestorians. This told of the work of the Nestorians, of the buildings of churches, and of the emperors who favored the faith. In the 13th century, a few Franciscan missionaries braved the perilous journey and made many converts, but with the fall of the Mongol dynasty, Christianity for a second time vanished and was not again preached in China until the 16th century, this time by the Jesuits. At first their teaching met with success, but with the coming of the Dominicans and Franciscans, disputes arose which greatly discredited the new religion among the Chinese for they could not understand why teachers of the same faith should quarrel among themselves. At last the emperor's patience was exhausted, and he ordered all friars, except those needed for his imperial observatory, to be killed. The first Protestant missionary arrived in China in 1807. End of section 51. This recording is in the public domain. Section 52 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific 
Read for LibriVox.org by Engineer STL An Enterprising Missionary by John of Corvino In the 13th and 14th centuries, the Franciscans made their way to the east. One of them, the John of Corvino, who gives the following account of his efforts, worked in entirely alone for eleven years. The Editor I, Brother John, of Mount Corvine, of the Order of Minor Friars, made my way to Cathay, the realm of the Emperor of the Tartars, who is called the Grand Khan. To him I presented the letter of our Lord the Pope, and invited him to adopt the Catholic faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he had grown too old in idolatry. However, he bestows many kindnesses upon the Christians, and these two years past I am abiding with him. I have built a church in the city of Peking, in which the king has his chief residence. This I completed six years ago, and I have built a bell tower to it and put three bells in it. I have baptized there, as well as I can estimate, up to this time some six thousand persons. Also I have gradually bought one hundred and fifty boys, the children of pagan parents, and of ages varying from seven to eleven, who had never learned any religion. These boys I have baptized, and I have taught them Greek and Latin after our manner. Also I have written out psalters for them, with thirty hymnaries and two breviaries. By help of these, eleven of the boys already know our service, and form a choir, and take their weekly turn of duty as they do in convents, whether I am there or not. Many of the boys are also employed in writing out psalters and other things suitable. His Majesty the Emperor moreover delights much to hear them chanting. I have the bells rung at all the canonical hours, and with my congregation of babes and sucklings I perform divine service and the chanting we do by ear because I have no service book with the notes. I beg the Minister General of our order to supply me with the antiphonarium, with the legend of the saints, a gradual, and a psalter with the musical notes as a copy. For I have nothing but a pocket breviary with the short lessons and a little missal. If I had one for a copy, the boys of whom I have spoken could transcribe others from it, just now I am building a church with the view of distributing the boys in more places than one. I have grown old and gray, more with toil and trouble than with years, for I am not more than fifty-eight. I have a competent knowledge of the language and character which is most generally used by the Tartars, and I have already translated into that language and character the New Testament and the Psalter, and have caused them to be written out in the fairest penmanship they have. And so by writing, reading, and preaching, I bear open and public testimony to the law of Christ. End of section 52. This recording is in the public domain. Section 53 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Locke of Floyd, Virginia. The World Story, Volume 1, China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 53, The Woman with the Cross, by Mendez Pinto chained together as we were we went up and down the streets craving of alms which were very liberally given us by the inhabitants who wondering to see such men as we demanded of us what kind of people we were of what kingdom and how our country was called hereunto we answered conformably to what we had said before namely that we were natives of the kingdom of siam that going from liampu to nanquin we had lost all our goods by shipwreck and that although they beheld us then in so poor a case yet we had formerly been very rich whereupon a woman who was come thither among the rest to see us 
it is very likely said she speaking to them about her that what these poor strangers have related is most true for daily experience doth show how those that trade by sea do oftentimes make it their grave wherefore it is best and surest to travel upon the earth and to esteem of it as of that whereof it has pleased god to frame us saying so she gave us two mazes which amounts to about sixteen pence of our money advising us to make no more such long voyages since our lives were so short hereupon she unbuttoned one of the sleeves of a red satin gown she had on and bearing her left arm she showed us a cross imprinted upon it like the mark of a slave do any of you know this sign which amongst those that follow the way of truth is called a cross or have any of you heard it named to this falling down on our knees we answered with tears in our eyes that we knew exceeding well then lifting up her hands she cried out our father which art in heaven hallowed be thy name speaking these words in the portugal tongue and because she could speak no more of our language she very earnestly desired us in chinese to tell her whether we were christians we replied that we were and for proof thereof after we had kissed that arm whereon the cross was we repeated all the rest of the lord's prayer which she had left unsaid wherewith being assured that we were christians indeed she drew aside from the rest there present and weeping said to us come along christians of the other end of the world with her that is your true sister in the faith of jesus christ or peradventure a kinswoman to one of you by his side that begot me in this miserable exile and so going to carry us to her house the hoopus which guarded us would not suffer her saying that if we would not continue our craving of alms they would return us back to the ship but this they spake in regard of their own interest for that they were to have the moiety of what was given us and accordingly they made as though they would have led us thither again which the woman perceiving i understand your meaning said she and indeed it is but reason you should make the best of your places for thereby you live so opening her purse she gave them two tias in silver wherewith they were very well satisfied whereupon she carried us home to her house and there kept us all the while we remained in that place making much of us and using us very charitably here she showed us an oratory wherein she had a cross of wood gilt as also candlesticks and a lamp of silver furthermore she told us that she was named inez de la ria and her father tome pires who had been great ambassador from portugal to the king of china and that in regard of an insurrection with a portuguese captain made at canton the chineses taking him for a spy and not for an ambassador as he termed himself clapped him and all his followers up in prison where by order of justice five of them were put to torture receiving so many such cruel stripes on their bodies as they died instantly and the rest were all banished into several parts together with her father into this place where he married with her mother that had some means and how he made her a christian living so seven-and-twenty years together and converting many gentiles to the faith of christ whereof there were above three hundred then abiding in that town which every sunday assembled in her house to say the catechism whereupon demanding of her what were their accustomed prayers she answered that she used no other but these which on their knees with their eyes and hands lift up to heaven they pronounced in this manner o lord jesus christ as it is most true that thou art the very son of god conceived by the holy ghost of the virgin mary for the salvation of sinners 
so thou wilt be pleased to forgive us our offences that thereby we may become worthy to behold thy face in the glory of thy kingdom where thou art sitting at the right hand of the almighty our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name in the name of the father the son and the holy ghost amen and so all of them kissing the cross embraced one another and thereupon every one returned to his own home moreover she told us that her father had left her many other prayers which the chineses had stolen from her so that she had none left but those before recited whereunto we replied that those we had heard from her were very good but before we went away we would leave her divers other good and wholesome prayers do so then answered she for the respect you owe to so good a god as yours is and that hath done such things for you for me and all in general then causing the cloth to be laid she gave us a very good and plentiful dinner and treated us in like sort every meal during the five days we continued in her house which was permitted by the chiffiu in regard of a present that this good woman sent his wife whom she earnestly entreated so to deal with her husband as we might be well entreated for that we were men of whom god had a particular care as the chiffiu's wife promised her to do with many thanks to her for the present she had received in the mean space during the five days we remained in her house we read the catechism seven times to the christians wherewithal they were very much edified besides christoforo borbalho made them a little book in the chinese tongue containing the pater noster the creed the ten commandments and many other good prayers after these things we took our leaves of inez de leria and the christians who gave us fifty tias in silver which stood us since in good stead and withal inez de leria gave us secretly fifty tias more humbly desiring us to remember her in our prayers to god End of section fifty three this recording is in the public domain recorded by jim locke section number fifty four of china japan and the islands of the pacific ready for librivox dot org by brianna the worship of ancestors by w a p martin one of the greatest difficulties met by the missionaries in trying to convert the chinese was that if they became christians they would be obliged to give up worshipping their ancestors and offering up prayers to them this was a most important matter. One Wu Wang, who founded the famous Chao dynasty in which Confucius lived, declared that it was right to rebel against the former emperor, because with all his other misdeeds, he had even neglected to offer up the proper sacrifices at the tombs of his ancestors. The Editor Every household has somewhere within its doors a small shrine in which are deposited the tablets of ancestors and of all deceased members of the family who have passed the age of infancy each clan has its ancestral temple which forms a rallying point for all who belong to the common stock in such temples as in the smaller shrines the household the objects of reverence are not images but tablets slips of wood inscribed with the name of the deceased together with the dates of birth and death in these tablets according to popular belief dwell the spirits of the dead before them ascends the smoke of a daily incense and twice in the month offerings of fruits and other eatables are presented accompanied by solemn prostrations in some cases particularly during a period of mourning the members of the family salute the dead morning and evening as they do the living and on special occasions such as marriage or a funeral there are religious services of a more elaborate character accompanied 
sometimes by feasts and theatrical shows. Besides worship in presence of the representative tablet, periodical rites are performed at the family cemetery. In spring and autumn, when the mildness of the air is such as to invite excursions, city families are wont to choose a day for visiting the resting places of their dead. Clearing away the grass and covering the tombs with a layer of fresh earth, they present offerings and perform acts of worship. This done, they pass the rest of the day in enjoying the scenery of the country. End of section 54. This recording is in the public domain. Section 55 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Locke of Floyd, Virginia. The World's Story, Volume 1, China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Edited by Eva March Tappan section fifty five teaching science to the emperor by pere du Halde. in the sixteenth century ricci a jesuit missionary came to china and was followed by others of the same order they showed a great amount of tact in dealing with the natives the following account explains one method by which they made their way the editor this nation naturally proud looked upon themselves as the most learned in the world and they enjoyed this reputation without disturbance because they were acquainted with no other people more knowing than themselves but they were undeceived by the ingenuity of the missionaries who appeared at court the proof which they gave of their capacity served greatly to authorize their ministry and to gain esteem for the religion which they preached the late emperor kang he whose chief delight was to acquire knowledge was never weary of seeing or hearing them on the other hand the jesuits perceiving how necessary the protection of this great prince was to the progress of the gospel omitted nothing that might excite his curiosity and satisfy this natural relish for the sciences they gave him an insight into optics by making him a present of a semi-cylinder of a light kind of wood in the middle of its axis was placed a convex glass which being turned toward any object painted the image within the tube to a great nicety the emperor was greatly pleased with so unusual a sight and desired to have a machine made in his garden at peking wherein without being seen himself he might see everything that passed in the streets and neighbouring places they prepared for this purpose an object glass of much greater diameter and made in the thickest garden wall a great window in the shape of a pyramid the basis of which was towards the garden and the point toward the street at the point they fixed the glass eye over against the place where there was the greatest concourse of people at the basis was made a large closet shut up close on all sides and very dark it was there the emperor came with his queens to observe the lively images of everything that passed in the street and this sight pleased him extremely but it charmed the princesses a great deal more who could not otherwise behold this spectacle the custom of china not allowing them to go out of the palace pere grimaldi gave another wonderful spectacle by his skill in optics in the jesuits garden at peking which greatly astonished the grandees of the emperor they made upon the four walls four human figures every one being of the same length as the wall which was fifty feet as he had perfectly observed the optic rules there was nothing seen on the front but mountains forests chases and other things of this nature but at a certain point they perceived the figure of a man well made and well proportioned 
the emperor honoured the jesuit's house with his presence and beheld these figures a long time with admiration the grandees and principal mandarins who came in crowds were equally surprised but that which struck them most was to see the figures so regular and so exact upon irregular walls that in several places had large windows and doors it would be too tedious to mention all the figures that seemed in confusion and yet were seen distinctly at a certain point or were put in order with conic cylindric pyramidal mirrors and the many other wonders in optics that pair grimaldi discovered to the finest geniuses in china and which raised their surprise and wonder in catoptrix they presented the emperor with all sorts of telescopes as well for astronomical observation as for taking great and small distances upon the earth and likewise glasses for diminishing magnifying and multiplying among other things they presented him with a tube made like a prism having eight sides which being placed parallel with the horizon presented eight different scenes so lifelike that they might be mistaken for the objects themselves this being joined to the variety of painting entertained the emperor a long time they likewise presented another tube wherein was a polygon glass which by its different facets collected into one image several parts of different objects insomuch that instead of a landscape woods flocks and a hundred other things represented in a picture there was seen distinctly a human face or some other figure very exact there was also another machine which contained a lighted lamp the light of which came through a tube at the end whereof was a convex glass near which several small pieces of glass painted with divers figures were made to slide these figures were seen upon the opposite wall of a size proportioned to the size of the wall this spectacle in the night-time or in a very dark place frightened those who were ignorant of the artifice as much as it pleased those who were acquainted with it on this account they have given it the name of the magic lantern nor was the perspective forgotten pere bruglio gave the emperor three drafts wherein the rules were exactly kept he showed three copies of the same in the jesuits garden at peking the mandarins who flocked to this city from all parts came to see them out of curiosity and were all equally struck with the sight they could not conceive how it was possible on a plain cloth to represent halls galleries porticoes roads and alleys that seemed to reach as far as the eye could see and all this so naturally that at the first sight they were deceived by it statics likewise had its turn they offered the emperor a machine the principal parts of which were only four notched wheels and an iron grapple with the help of this machine a child raised several thousand weight without difficulty and stood firm against the efforts of twenty strong men with respect to hydrostatics they made for the emperor pumps canals siphons wheels and several other machines proper to raise water above the level of the spring and among others a machine which they made use of to raise water out of the river called the ten thousand springs and to carry it into the ground belonging to the emperor's demesnes as he had desired pere grimaldi also made a present to the emperor of a hydraulic machine of a new type there appeared in it a ceaseless jet d'eau or cascade a clock that went very true the motions of the heavens and an accurate alarm the pneumatic machines also did no less excite the emperor's curiosity they caused a wagon to be made of light wood about two feet long in the middle of it they placed a brazen vessel full of live coals and upon that an ilo pile the wind of which came through a little pipe upon a sort of wheel made like the sails of a windmill 
this little wheel turned another with an axle-tree and by that means set the wagon in motion for two hours together but lest room should be wanting to proceed constantly forward it was contrived to move circularly in the following manner to the axle-tree of the two hind wheels was fixed a small beam and at the end of this beam another axle-tree which went through the centre of another wheel somewhat larger than the rest and according as this wheel was nearer or farther from the wagon it described a greater or lesser circle the same contrivance was likewise fixed to a little ship with four wheels the ilopile was hid in the middle of the ship and the wind proceeding out of two small pipes filled the little sails and made it wheel about a long while the artifice being concealed there was nothing heard but a noise like a blast of wind or like that which water makes about a vessel i have already spoken of the organ which was presented to the emperor but as this was defective in many things per Pereira, made a larger one and placed it in the jesuits church at peking the novelty of this harmony charmed the chinese but that which astonished them most was that this organ played of itself chinese as well as european airs and sometimes both together it was well known as i have elsewhere mentioned that what gave per ricci a favourable admission into the emperor's court was a clock and a striking watch of which he made him a present this prince was so much charmed with it that he built a magnificent tower purposely to place it in and because the queen-mother had a desire for a striking watch the emperor had recourse to a stratagem to disappoint her by ordering the watch to be shown her without calling her attention to the striking part so that she not finding it according to her fancy sent it back they did not fail afterwards to comply with the emperor's taste for great quantities of curious things were sent out of europe by christian princes who had the conversion of this great empire at heart insomuch that the emperor's cabinet was soon filled with various rarities especially clocks of the most recently invented type and most curious workmanship Per Pereira, who had singular talent for music, placed a large and magnificent clock on the top of the Jesuit's church. He had made a great number of small bells in a musical proportion and placed them in a tower appointed for that purpose. Every hammer was fastened to an iron wire which raised it and immediately let it fall upon the bell within the tower was a large barrel upon which christian airs were marked with small spikes immediately before the hour the barrel was disengaged from the teeth of a wheel by which it was suspended and stopped it then was instantly set in motion by a great weight the string of which was wound about the barrel the spikes raised the wires of the hammers according to the order of the tune so that by this means the finest airs of the country were heard this was a diversion entirely new both for the court and city and crowds of all sorts came constantly to hear it the church though large was not sufficient for the throng that incessantly went backward and forward whenever any extraordinary phenomena such as a parhelion rainbows etc appeared in the heavens the emperor immediately sent for the missionaries to explain their causes they composed several books concerning these natural appearances and to support their explanations in the most sensible manner they contrived a machine to represent the effects of nature in the heavens it was a drum made very close and whitened on the inside the inward surface represented the heavens the light of the sun entering through a little hole passed through a triangular prism of glass and fell upon a polished cylinder from this cylinder it was reflected upon the concavity of the drum and exactly painted the colour of the rainbow from a part of the cylinder a little flattened 
was reflected the image of the sun and by other refractions and reflections were shown the halos about sun and moon and all the rest of the phenomena relating to celestial colours according as the prism was more or less inclined towards the cylinder they also presented the emperor with thermometers to show the several degrees of heat and cold to which was added a very nice hygrometer to discover the several degrees of moisture and dryness it was a barrel of a large diameter suspended by a thick string made of catgut of a proper length and parallel to the horizon the least change in the air contracts or relaxes the string and causes the barrel to turn sometimes to the right sometimes to the left and stretches or loosens to the right or left upon the circumference of the barrel a small string which draws a little pendulum and marks the several degrees of humidity on one and on the other those of dryness all these different inventions of human wit till then unknown to the chinese abated something of their natural pride and taught them not to have too contemptible an opinion of foreigners nay it so far altered their way of thinking that they began to look upon europeans as their masters End of section fifty five this recording is in the public domain Recording by Jim Locke of Floyd, Virginia. Section 56 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Davis. The World Story, Volume 1, China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific edited by eva march tappan section fifty six the emperor and the musician by per du halde the chinese like the european music well enough provided that there is but one voice to accompany the sound of several instruments but as for the contrast of different voices of grave and acute sounds they are not at all agreeable to their taste for they look upon them as no better than disagreeable confusion they have no musical notes nor any sign to denote the diversity of tones the rising or falling of the voice and the rest of the variations that constitute harmony the airs which they sing or play upon their instruments are got only by rote and are learned by the ear nevertheless they make new ones from time to time the ease wherewith we retain an air after the first hearing by the assistance of notes extremely surprised the late emperor in the year 1679, he sent for Per Grimaldi and Per Pereira to play upon an organ and the harpsichord that they had formerly presented him. He liked our European airs and seemed to take great pleasure in them. Then he ordered his musicians to play a Chinese air upon their instruments, and played likewise himself in a very graceful manner. Per Pereira took his pocket-book and pricked down all the tune while the musicians were playing, and when they had finished, repeated it without missing a note which the emperor could scarcely believe his surprise was so great that the father had learned in so short a time an air which had been so troublesome to him and his musicians and that by the assistance of the characters he could recollect it at any time with pleasure to be more certain of this he put him to trial several times and sang several different airs which the father took down in his book and then repeated exactly with the greatest accuracy it must be owned cried the emperor european music is incomparable and this father has not his equal in all the empire this prince afterward established an academy of music and made the most skilful persons in that science members of it and committed it to the care of his third son a man of letters and who had read much they began by examining all the authors that had written upon the subject they caused all sorts of instruments to be made after the ancient manner and according to the size proposed the faults of these instruments were discovered and corrected after which they composed a book in four tomes with the title the true doctrine of liu lu written by the order of the emperor to these four tomes they added a fifth concerning the elements of european music made by p pereira chinese music
End of section 56. This recording is in the public domain. Section 57 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific, read for LibriVox.org by Andrea. The Man Who Was Afraid of Becoming a Horse by Per du Halde. Although these stories were written by Per du Halde, they were made up from letters and reports of a number of Jesuit missionaries. The editor. They called me one day to baptize a sick person who was an old man of seventy and lived upon a small pension given him by the emperor. When I entered his room, he said, I am obliged to you, my father, that you are going to deliver me from a heavy punishment. That is not all, replied I. Baptism not only delivers persons from hell, but conducts them to a life of blessedness. I do not comprehend, replied the sick person, what it is you say, and perhaps I have not sufficiently explained myself. You know that for some time I have lived on the Emperor's benevolence, and the bonzes, Buddhist priests, who are well instructed in what passes in the next world, have assured me that out of gratitude I should be obliged to serve him after death, and that my soul would infallibly pass into a post-horse to carry dispatches out of the provinces to court. For this reason they exhort me to perform my duty well when I shall have assumed my new being, and to take care not to stumble, nor wince, nor bite, nor hurt anybody. Besides, they direct me to travel well, to eat little, to be patient, and by that means move the compassion of the deities, who often convert a good beast into a man of quality, and make him a considerable mandarin. I own, father, that this thought makes me shudder, and I cannot think on it without trembling. I dream of it every night, and sometimes when I am asleep I think myself, harnessed and ready to set out at the first stroke of the rider. I then wake in a sweat, and under great concern, not being able to determine whether I am a man or a horse, but alas, what will become of me when I shall be a horse in reality? This, then, my father, is the resolution that I am come to. They say that those of your religion are not subject to these miseries, that men continue to be men, and shall be the same in the next world as they are in this. I beseech you to receive me among you. I know that your religion is hard to be observed, but if it was still more difficult, I am ready to embrace it and whatever it cost me, I should rather be a Christian than become a beast. This discourse and the present condition of the sick person excited my compassion, but reflecting afterwards that God makes use of simplicity and ignorance to lead men to the truth, I took occasion to undeceive him in his errors and to direct him in the way of salvation. I gave him instructions a long time, and at length, he believed that I had the consolation to see him die not only with the most rational sentiments, but with all the marks of a good Christian. End of section 57. This recording is in the public domain. Section 58 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Read for LibriVox.org by Brianna. How the Bounces Got the Ducks by Père Lecomte. There was no end to the deceits that these bones practiced upon the Chinese. The following tale of their trickery is a favorite among the more intelligent Chinamen. The Editor. Two of these bonzes, one day perceiving in the court of a rich peasant two or three large ducks, prostrated themselves before the door and began to sigh and weep bitterly. The good woman who perceived them from her chamber came out to learn the reason of their grief. We know, they said, 
that the souls of our fathers have passed into the bodies of these creatures and the fear we are under that you should kill them will certainly make us die with grief i own said the woman that we were determined to sell them but since they are your parents i promise to keep them this was not what the bonzes wanted and therefore they added perhaps your husband will not be so charitable as yourself and you may rest assured that it will be fatal to us if any accident happens to them in short after a great deal of discourse the good woman was so moved with their seeming grief that she gave them the ducks to take care of which they took very respectfully after several protestations and the self-same evening made a feast of them for their little society. End of section 58 This recording is in the public domain.